All right. Amen. Psalm chapter number 16. I'm preaching about the subject of this. Well, I'll just start off with the title. The title is Jesus went to hell for three days and three nights. And that's what I'm going to be preaching about this evening. Um, and so with that being said, we're just going to go throughout the Bible and just look at different passages and just basically teach this doctrine. Just give you some things to think about, give you some uh, ideas and places to go to to take people that may question this doctrine while you're out soul winning or you're trying to disciple somebody. Now, you know, let's be honest, I think we've all heard people's opposition to this doctrine. One of the big arguments that I hear is, well, that's what the Catholics believe, or that's what the Pentecostals believe. You know, well, if, if that's true, then I, I guess they're right on that, you know. <laughs> you know, it doesn't mean they're wrong about every single little thing, just most things, right? The, uh, and, you know, if, if that's true, uh, and it is, I've met Pentecostals that say, you know, they believe that, you know. Um, you know, that just means that they're one step closer to the truth than you are, right? And, and, and just before I even start with this, I'm not saying that a person has to believe this in order to be saved. They have to believe the gospel, the death, the burial, and the resurrection, right? So don't miss, quote, I got a lot of information to go through. Hopefully we can get it all. The Bible does really, when you look at the subject, it speaks a lot about it. And so obviously, you know, with this doctrine, what comes next? Abraham's bosom and then comes Zionism. You know, all that stuff's all connected together. So we need to take the time to consistently go through these things. Obviously not once a quarter. I think the last time I preached this was probably last year, I think, right? And with Easter coming up, I figured, you know, it's definitely an appropriate time to get this thing going. And uh, let's go ahead and rip the head off of the, the doctrine that says that he didn't go to hell. The doctrine that says that he went to a place called paradise or Abraham's bosom. This two compartment abode of the dead in the Old Testament where the bad people went to the bad side and the good people went to the good side. Is that what the Bible teaches? Let's take a look and see. So Psalm chapter 16, we'll start off in verse number 7. It says, I will bless the Lord who hath given me counsel. My reins also instruct me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. What do we have here? We have David describing the coming of the future Messiah. And if you notice the context here, as we read the next few verses, one thing that you're going to see is the eternal context here. And so that's just proven by itself that it's not talking about David specifically. Verse 9 says, Therefore my heart is glad, and my glory rejoiceth. Right? And that's also um, talking about a verbal rejoicing, and you're going to learn about that in Acts chapter 2, because Peter quotes this chapter and actually expounds upon that. So he says, therefore, my heart is glad, and my glory rejoiceth my flesh also shall rest in hope. Okay, that's important there. Why is his flesh going to rest in hope? Verse 10, for thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Now, can you point to a verse in the Bible that says that David by himself is the holy one? No, you definitely can't. This is not talking about David. But in my life, I have had people try to say that about this passage here. Try to say, well, that's mainly just talking about David. But if you want to include that as a picture of Jesus Christ, then this just basically talking about how he went to paradise and preached to the spirits in prison. Again, we're going to address that later on. It's false doctrine. Verse 10 again, for thou will not leave my soul in hell. That's important. As we study this, don't forget that phrase, my soul in hell. It doesn't say my flesh in hell. It doesn't say my spirit in hell. But it says, for thou will not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Right? So what do we have here? We have basically the Old Testament uh, definition of resurrection. Right? right. We have the, the, the physical component, the flesh. Jesus' flesh did not rot. It did not see corruption. Nor did his soul get succumbed to the second death. He escaped that. Hell couldn't hold him. Verse 11 says, Thou will show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. And just notice that eternal context that's just woven throughout the entire chapter there. Now go to Acts chapter 2. You know about where we're going to start. Acts chapter number 2. And what we're going to do is we're just going to take a look at Peter here. And what is he doing? He's preaching a sermon, right? He's preaching to the Jews and he's explaining, hey, look. Jesus had to come, he had to die, and here's where his soul did go for three days and three nights after he died on the cross. Let's pick it up in verse 23, Acts chapter 2, verse 23. 
It says him talking about Christ, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. So he's saying, hey, God had the foreknowledge that this was going to happen. It was written about him. This shouldn't shock you. This should come as no surprise to you. Verse 24, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death. Okay, so at some point, the pains of death had a hold on the soul of Jesus Christ. Does that sound like the good compartment of a place called Abraham's bosom? No, no it doesn't. It doesn't sound very pleasant, does it? No, it's ridiculous to say otherwise. So it says, whom God, verse 24, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Verse 25. For David speaketh concerning him. I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. So again, Peter is quoting the Old Testament here. He's quoting the Psalm saying, hey, this shouldn't shock you. This shouldn't be a surprise to you, right? It was written about him and David spoke about this thing. Look for verse 25 again. It says, for David speaketh concerning him. Now, obviously David spoke these Psalms, but Really, by the time Peter's quoting this, they were just written. Peter, David wasn't alive yet, right? It's just a quick plug for God's word being preserved forever, right? Yes. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. That's what Jesus said. Yes. So David, or I'm not, I'm sorry, but Peter, he's basically just reaffirming that as he's preaching. He says, for David speaketh concerning him. I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Basically bringing their attention back to the Psalms and saying, hey, remember this Psalm, Eternal context. This psalm proves that hell couldn't hold him. He did raise from the dead. You, un, you need to understand this. Verse 26, it says, Therefore, so for that reason, right? Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Now, it doesn't say that in the psalms, right? What did it say? He said, And my glory rejoiceth. But Peter here, he expounds on that and he quotes it as saying, And my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh shall rest in hope. Remember, Jesus Christ, fully man, fully God. In the flesh, on the fully man portion, this looking ahead had to have been burdensome to him, right? He had to have looked at that and, and, and felt anguish, travail, pain. Look, if you were to hang over hell for 30 seconds, you'd be scared. Yeah. If God came down and said, all right, all you guys in here right now, I'm going to hang you over hell for about 35 seconds. Don't tell me you wouldn't be scared, okay? And that's just a, a little dip. <laughs> right? If he were to do that, you, you, would, you would be fearful. Right. Well, he's understanding where he's going to go to become the offering for us, right? And how did he find comfort in that? In that which was written in the Bible. That he knew, look, God's not going to leave his soul there. So he says, my flesh shall rest in hope, verse 27, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Okay, verse 28. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Verse 29. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Again, he's bringing to their attention common sense. Hey, you guys know David's dead. You can go visit a sepulcher, okay? It's not talking about David. It's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ and that he would become the great offering for our sins. Verse 30, Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. Now, verse 31. This is the one that I take uh, people to often out soul winning or if they have a question. And you know what I find funny? I would say like a majority of the time that I show somebody this out soul winning, they don't disagree. Yeah. It's usually the knucklehead new evangelical who's been going to the little apologetics class now for a couple years that wants to argue this point. Oh, he went to paradise. He went to paradise. So verse 31. He seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ. There you have it. Now you have the definition of the word resurrection. You're going to see that word a lot in the coming in the next coming few days, right? Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday. You're going to see that. Most people have no idea what the definition is. It has two components. Look at the verse, 231. He seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ that his soul was not left in hell neither his flesh did see corruption. There's two parts to that word there, resurrection. So if 
I were to pass out a test to a bunch of Christians and you didn't include both of these, I would mark you minus one. You would be incorrect. You have to get these both down as they're written in order to get the question right. And as God's people, like I always say, week after week, we need to make sure that we have the fundamentals right. And this is a fundamental doctrine, my friend. Verse 32, this Jesus hath God raised up whereof we are all witnesses. So he's like, hey, look, if what was written isn't enough for you, if what I've made sense to you isn't enough for you, how about the fact that we saw him and many of us saw him on different occasions and all of our stories match? How about that? So turn to Matthew chapter number 12, Matthew chapter number 12. And so I'm just going to make a few statements as we go through this study tonight. So you turn to Matthew chapter 12. And here's the first statement that I want to make. Not only did Peter preach this doctrine, but so did the Lord Jesus Christ. So not, pay attention, not only did Peter preach this doctrine, but so did the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 12, look at verse 38. It says this, Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. And then he's going to explain what that is. So he's like, hey, here's your sign. Believe the gospel. Okay, You need to believe the words of God. There's your sign. You're not going to get a miracle. You are going to get miracles, but you're not going to believe them anyways, most of you by and large. Right? So verse 40, for as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Turn to Jonah chapter 2. <laughs> Turn to Jonah chapter 2. Now let me ask you a question here. In the heart of the earth, is six feet under the heart of the earth? No. no. Is being in a tomb the heart of the earth? <laughs> no. Right, so what is he talking about there? He's talking about the center of the earth. Now, in order for there to be a center of the earth or the heart of the earth, it probably means the earth's a globe, right? It's a sphere, okay? Just just saying that, right? That's not what the sermon's about, but it's just, you know, one more proof text there. I know that's going to get some people upset. I don't hate you, but, you know, you got to kind of think about these things, okay? So he says that the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And of course, a lot of people, dispensationalists, Calvinists, uh, the scholarly types alike will say, well, this is it. He didn't go to hell. He went to Sheol or he went to Hades. He went to the grave. I had a, pap- a pastor one time, you know, used to be a Baptist. He's King James, hymns only. Um, and he, every time in the Old Testament, he would read the word hell. He'd be like, you need to cross that out and write grave. Right. It's the grave because he made his grave with the wicked, which we'll talk about that later. Right. So let's talk about this because Jesus says, hey, just like Jonah, right, just like Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly. So shall the son of man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So in order to fully understand that, let's understand what Jonah actually went through, what he says here in Jonah chapter two. Let's read up in verse one. And it says this, Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly. So where is he at now? He's in the belly, like the center of the fish, right? right. He's not like sewn into like the surface. He's not hanging off the fin, right? Yeah. He's not just under the first layer of skin or stuck under the fat. No, he's in the, in the heart of the, he's in the, the, the center of the, the fish, yeah. in the belly. Verse 2, And said, I cried by reason of my inflection unto the Lord, and he heard me, out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. Now that's interesting there, that he equates the belly of that whale with hell. Yeah. What's going on here? I think somebody's trying to tell us something. Yeah. I think somebody's trying to tell the Old Testament saints something. Yeah. Hey, when Jesus says this in the future, guess what? Believe him. Yeah. You know what? There's a lot of people that believe that the story of Jonah is fake. But yet they'll tell you all day long, well, I believe in Jesus Christ, so I love him. No, you don't. You're a liar and you're a fraud if that's what you say. Look, I talked to this guy one time and he's like, I'm a Sunday school teacher, but I don't believe that Jonah really went into the whale's belly. I was like, man, Jesus even quoted that. Well, you know, not everything he said was right. Whoa. Wow. But you say you love Jesus, right? Yeah, oh yeah, I, I do. You know, I, 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 I believe he's a, he, you know, he's a son of God. I, I believe all that. 
But no, you don't. Yeah. You're a loser right now telling me this. Right. What an idiot. Verse 3, For thou hadst cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about, and all thy billows and thy waves passed over me. What would this be like if you were to experience this right here, this verse 2, right? In the deep, in the midst of the seas, floods compass me about, all thy billows and waves pass over me. Terror, travail, torment, yeah. darkness, right? Yeah. This is a parallel to what we read in Matthew chapter 12 and to what actually Jesus went through here. Look at verse 4. Then said, or I'm sorry, then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. Does that not describe what Jesus' attitude was regarding this whole situation? Psalm 16, Acts chapter 2. Did he say he would rejoice and his tongue was glad because what? He, God wouldn't leave a soul in hell, right? I mean, that's exactly what I see when I look at this here, right? I will look again toward thy holy temple. Verse 5, the waters compass me about, even to the soul. Now, it's funny. There's that word again, soul. And I'll get to that later in the sermon. I just want you to, every time you see that tonight, to remember that. Soul, the depth closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. You know, and just studying this and just kind of thinking about this, it should give you some good appreciation for what Christ did for us, right? I mean, think about that. I mean, that, that, that's amazing to me. That makes me want to go out and get more people saved. That makes me want to live the best life that I can. That makes me want to be uh, sanctified for His name. Amen. You know, because knowing that He went through this, verse 6, I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Now, come on. Now, I believe 100% that Jonah was in the, in the, in the whale's belly. Yeah. No doubt about it, right? But did the whale take him down to the bottoms of the mountains? I mean... You look what he's saying here. The earth with her bars was about me forever, forever. Well, jo Jonas was only in there for three days and three nights. Right. But Jesus stepped into eternity to burn. Right. And I'm not saying he's burning there right now, but he stepped in to that eternal time frame to go to hell for us. Right. And look at I mean, just look at the language there. That's exactly what he's talking about there. So read the verse again. Verse six. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. Thou shalt not, thou will not leave my soul in hell, neither shall his flesh see corruption. See, the same language. You see the connections here? It's the same thing. It's obviously talking about the Lord Jesus Christ that is woven into this story here. Verse 7, When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came in unto thee, into thine holy temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy, but I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pray, I'm sorry, I will pay that, that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. And it's interesting how it goes right into that, right? I mean, starting from verse 6, you, you really, he's really pouring it on about how, uh, about the, 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 the foreverness, right? And being uh, surrounded by, with the bars of the earth and stuff like that. And then he says, when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came in unto thee, in verse 7, into thine holy temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. So what is he saying there? Hey, these people out there that just want to just regard what man has to say and just believe the lies because it's convenient, because it's uh, going to get you somewhere in life at this time. He's like saying, hey, that's the wrong way to go. You're forsaking your own mercy. Yeah. You're forsaking your own mercy. This is obviously talking about Christ, verse 9. But I will sacrifice unto thee with a voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that, that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. And the Lord spake unto the fish and it vomited him out. Um, or vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. Go to Matthew chapter number 27. Now, another thing that you'll recall later on when we go to the first mention of hell in the Bible in Deuteronomy chapter 32 is that it talks about the mountains, about God's fire and his, his anger burning to the lowest parts of hell. It talks about mountains and it talks about um, basically everything you see here in Jonah. And all of these things are connected together. And the reason why I bring that up is because the doctrine of hell is consistent from Deuteronomy chapter 32 all the way through the end, uh, or the 54th verse, you know, or, or time that it's mentioned in the Bible in Revelation. You know, and not one time are you going to 
get even an inkling that it's this two compartment place. Right. Right. You have to be taught that by somebody. Yep. Sure. You have to be educated into that. There's no way you're going to get a Bible, read the whole thing and come to that conclusion. Right. Yep. There's, there's just no way it's, it, it's impossible. And if somebody tells you that they came to that conclusion, show me the Bible that you're reading. What are you reading? The message or, or something like that? Or you maybe one, one of these modern perversions, maybe. But you're not going to read a King James Bible and come to that conclusion. Right. right. So here's a second statement that I want to make. You're in Matthew chapter 27. Is this real simple statement. The tomb is not the heart of the earth. Jesus said that he would be in the heart of the earth. Well, what's in the heart of the earth? Fire. Hell, brimstone, torments. Matthew 27, look at verse 59. It says, And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, verse 60, and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out of, in the rock, and he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. Look, did Jesus' body go six feet under? Didn't know. It went into a tomb, into a sepulcher, right? Yeah. So how are you going to say that that's the heart of the earth? Right. And that's why people say, okay, well, you got me there. But it was a two-compartment place called Abraham's bosom. <laughs> One side is paradise, and the other side is Hades or Sheol, depending on who you talk to. And that's where the bad people were. And then at the same time, they'll come around over here and say, and Jesus preached to the spirits in prison, and those that listened got to go with him, and they got like a second chance. I don't get it. I really, I, I mean, you want to talk about dis, I mean, just mental gymnastics. Yeah. I mean, playing Twister <laughs> with the Bible, right. you know, that, that, that's what you're doing there. Yep. That's what you're doing there. So it's like, well, he wouldn't even have had to go to the bad part to preach Right. to the bad people, but yet I don't get it. But yet he didn't go to the bad part. He didn't go to hell. I, <laughs> which one is it? So real quickly, the second thing I wanted to mention is this. The tomb is not the heart of the earth. Okay. The heart of the earth is the center of the earth. He uses the story of Jonah to prove that beyond a shadow of a doubt. So let's move on here. Turn to first Peter chapter number three. First Peter chapter number three. And we're going to take a look at some more stuff here. Here's the sec or the third statement that I want to make this evening, which is this. Jesus did not preach to people in hell or Abraham's bosom. Okay. When he was in the heart of the earth, there's nowhere that says that he was there preaching the gospel to those people. It's said in Acts that God would, that he was glad because the, uh, the pains of death were loosed. He knew that they were going to be loosed, right? Doesn't sound very pleasant. Pains and preaching. Okay, that's two different things. First Peter chapter 3, look at verse 18. Because here's what they'll do. They will take you to this passage here and quote this to you. First Peter 3, 18 says this. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Verse 19 by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. Okay, and then they'll stop you right there and say, see, he went to hell and he preached to the spirits in prison. Some of them listened. Others, they just liked being there because they hated God so much. And then they, you know, God had to leave them there. Je Jesus had to leave them there. Verse 20 says this, which sometime were disobedient. So then they'll say, see, so that's saying that sometimes they were disobedient, so they had to go to hell. Because remember, in the Old Testament, according to the dispensationalists and a lot of other people, that you had to get to heaven by doing works plus having faith. Right. So, and, and look, by the way, obviously we know that is not true. I don't have time to preach that to you, but salvation has always been a free gift. It's yeah. always been the same. The only thing that's different now versus in David's time was you call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Back then they didn't know him by that name. Right. So obviously verse 20 cannot be talking about that, which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing, wherein few that is eight souls were saved by water. 
Now, he's not saying that these people in Noah's day were saved and going to heaven because of water. Right. <laughs> right? He's trying to make a point here because he's assuming that you've read the other scriptures by the time you got to 1 Peter and that you know that uh, verse 19 is not talking about him going to hell preaching the gospel. Right? He's talking about preaching to the captives. Verse 21 says, The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know, another just a side note, this is a good slam dunk verse for people that want to talk about works being part of their salvation. We're not saved by the putting away the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience. So you say, how can it tell whether or not somebody's saved? You know, well, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. What a person says uh, is responsible for their salvation is what they're trusting in. Now, right. say, well, I believe Jesus paid it all. He died for, you know, it's, it's a free gift. But if you don't live right, <laughs> well, then, you know, you got you to gotta keep asking for forgiveness every day. Well, then they're trusting in both, okay? They're not completely trusting on Christ. Pretty pretty uh, uh, self-explanatory here, right? And it's, it's not that hard. He says, but the answer of a good conscience towards God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Do you believe the resurrection? Yes or no. Okay. Verse 22, who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. All right. Um, keep your place there. Cause we're going to come back to first Peter, but go to Isaiah chapter 61. If you would, Isaiah chapter 61. So, I got the, the Ruckman Reference Bible here, and while you're turning to Isaiah 61, I'm just going to read to you what he says uh, regarding 1 Peter chapter 3. So there's a little footnote down here, and it says this. When Christ descended into the lower parts of the earth, Ephesians 4, 9, he preached to two different groups. 1 Peter 4, 6, and then he says, note, that the group here are spirits. And then he cites Hebrews 1, 7, talking about angels, and 2 Peter 2, 4. And then he says this, not souls. And the gospel is not preached to them. Okay. Does that make sense to anybody here? No. no. Okay. Yeah. I don't think so. But he says that verse 19 in 1 Peter saying that when Christ descended into the lower parts of the earth, he preached to two different groups. So, okay. I guess you're saying that he preached to the good side of Abraham's bosom and the bad side. So I guess he preached a motivational sermon to the guys over here in Abraham's bosom and then went over to hell and was like, hey, last chance, right? Final call. Anybody want to get saved? Huh? You want to get saved? Let's go. Come on, guys. It's what it says. <laughs> it's what it says. All right. So to explain First Peter, right, uh, if you don't mind, I mean... I think you should have Isaiah 61, verse 1, marked in your Bible, or, or just know to go there when somebody tries to take you to 1 Peter 3, 19. Verse 1, Isaiah 61, 1, it says this, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Verse 2, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn. Okay, and you could just read on there. But it's very clear here. I mean, you have the same language here in Isaiah 61.1. What do we have? Prison, mm -hmm. yeah. right? Captives. Look, it's not that hard to figure out 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 19. People who are not saved are literally in prison. Yep. They're held captive by the devil at his will. And we talked about that last Sunday. So Jesus preached the good tidings, the good news to people in prison. Yep. It's not that hard. It's not talking about people in hell. That's not what it means. So it's very clear. Look, I've got the scripture to back up what I'm telling you. They don't. They'll cite things here and there and hope you don't go look and think about it. But they really got this stuff extremely messed up. Now, turn to Ephesians chapter 4 because that's one of the, the groups that he talked about. Or one of the verses that Ruckman talked about there in his little notes. Ephesians chapter 4, look at verse 9, it says this. And this actually, all this does is just help what I'm saying. It just, it just verifies what I'm preaching to you. Ephesians 4, 9. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? It just proves that, hey, he did descend into the lower parts of the earth. 
So those verses, so Acts 2, Psalm 16, uh, Jonah chapter 2, you know, and, and everywhere else that we're reading about in the Bible, Jesus went to hell. Obviously, you know, or Jesus said himself in Matthew chapter 12, right? I'll be in the heart of the earth. It's not talking about the tomb because right. some people will say, well, he just meant the tomb. He was in the heart of the tomb and that's made out of rock and that's kind of like earth, right? Some of these people will stop at nothing right. to just octopus your mind, man. Yeah, just, yeah. just come in there with their dispensational, new evangelical, scholarly, Calvinistic tentacles and to just wrap that brain and just squeeze it if you let them until you just burst and you've got no brain cells left to believe what's written in the Bible. All right, verse 10. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. Look, all that does is prove what I'm saying. Do you see anything in here about a specific group of people out of like two different compartments that Jesus preached to? I, don't, I, I really don't think so. Go back to 1 Peter. 1 Peter, look at verse, uh, or 1 Peter chapter 4. Look at verse number five. So again, even if you were confused on 1 Peter chapter three, if you were to just read one chapter over, it would shed some light on what we just read. Let's pick it up in verse five, 1 Peter four, verse five. Who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead? For this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, Okay, and they'll say, well, yeah, all the dead go to hell. I, I agree. Okay, but let's finish the verse. Amen. That they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but the living according to God in the Spirit. But the end of all things is at hand. Be therefore sober and watch unto prayer. So verse 6 is very clear. For this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead. Another way of saying them that are in, in prison. Okay. It's, it's really the same thing. But why would he go on and say that they might be judged according to men in the flesh if this verse was talking about Jesus going to hell and preaching to the people that already rejected him? Right. Yeah. That doesn't make any sense. Okay. And so just, just remember, you know, a lot of times when people have these wild ideas, often if you just read past what they're saying and before what they're saying, you know, and actually you get some stuff in context, everything fits together like a glove, just like it should. Uh, turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. I'm going to read for you Hebrews 9, 27, which says this. It says, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. That's not just a New Testament doctrine. Right. Paul, or I believe it's Paul that wrote Hebrews. I could be wrong. But I believe that he's saying this. Hey, you guys, you Hebrews, right? Hebrews chapter 9, writing to the Hebrews. You guys should know this. This is a truth that we've been taught by our fathers that we've, we all understand. That as it is appointed unto men once to die, then is the second chance? Or then was the second chance? Yeah. No, but after this, the judgment. It's always been that way. Right. You have your chance on earth. Yep. If you reject it, you die and you go to hell. Right. It's that simple, right? I had you turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse, and we're going to look at verse 7 because it really is the same teaching, okay? Old Testament verse here. No doubt about that, right? I don't think anybody wants to debate this. Look what it says in verse 7. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit shall return unto God who gave it. So once you die, saved or lost, that spirit goes back to heaven. Right. So according to these dispensationalists and others like them, we're supposed to believe that Jesus went to paradise or Hades, which is the other side of paradise, and they got their spirit back. But he said, I mean, the wisest man who ever lived here under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost said, then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return to God who gave it. I mean, it's really the same thing as what Paul said, uh, or what it says in Hebrews, and it, as it is appointed to men once to die, but after this, the judgment. Look, he learned that from reading the Old Testament. Yes. It's just a foundational truth of life. You get one chance to live, after this, you're done. Right? I mean, it, it's that simple. Now, turn to Revelation chapter 20. 
And bouncing off of Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7, I'm just going to read for you uh, a very familiar verse, Hebrews 4.12, which says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Okay? So I, I, I've said this, I think I've taught this here before, what this verse means, the word of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, right? The, the, the good seed, that, that incorruptible seed. When a person believes that, what it does is it literally cuts a person right down the middle. It basically separates your soul and your spirit, right, from the joints and marrow, from the body. So then you have the soul and spirit, which is the new man. And then you just have your joints and marrow, which the flesh, that's, that's the old man. That's how this thing works. That's why I think it's important that you know Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7, because we are a trichotomy, right? Body, soul, and spirit. When the unsaved man dies, his soul goes to hell, his spirit goes back to God whom gave it, and his body goes into the ground and sees corruption. When the believer dies, really he doesn't die, his flesh dies, but the soul and spirit have already been divided by the word of God, already been sealed until the day of redemption. That, right, that soul gets attached to that spirit, it goes back to God who gave it. Yeah. So that new man goes right to heaven. Yeah. It's, it's a done deal. And then obviously flesh and blood shall not inherit the kingdom of God, so it goes into the ground. Right. And we get a new body. That's how those things work. That's why every time I, I, we read um, Acts chapter 2, and we've, we've been reading, uh, what, what, read Jonah chapter 2, Psalm chapter 16, and I've been saying pay attention to the word soul here, right? It's going to come into play here momentarily. So here's the next statement that I want to make. Hell is where the dead are and have always been. Hell is where the dead are and where they have always been. Okay, where the dead have always been. Revelation chapter 20, look at verse 11. It says this, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. So you could tell the person, if you want to trust in Christ plus your works, you want to become a worker of iniquity and preach that to other pre uh, people, well, guess what? Here's your fate. Here's what's going to happen to you. Verse 13, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to their works. Look, do you expect me to believe that this is just people that rejected Christ Jesus Christ in the Old Testament in hell, and then everybody moving forward? Because that's ridiculous. I've heard them say that some, I've heard some outlandish stories about what happened to people before Abraham's bosom. <laughs> was Abraham's bosom like? I mean, I don't even want to bring the stuff up because it's just, it's just so ridiculous. Verse 14, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Verse 15, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the, I'm sorry, yeah, was cast into the lake of fire. So look, all I'm trying to tell you is that by reading these verses here, I mean, when I read these, I see any, I see from the beginning of, of, of time, you know, people that have been in hell are, are here. But we're supposed to believe that hell was different in the Old Testament. And that's where Jesus went to that different place, right? It, it really doesn't make sense, especially going over everything that I've already read, right? That after a person dies, then the judgment. People say, well, that's just a New Testament verse. Yeah, well, it's written in the New Testament, but with the implication that you understood this from reading the scriptures. Right. Why would Paul or whoever wrote Hebrews, you know, be trying to prove their point, you know, with the New Testament? Not that they couldn't. But a lot, by, by the time the Hebrews was in writing, a lot of the New Testament hadn't been completed yet. And so I think he's trying to, I mean, you read Hebrews, he's, he's basically saying, hey, this is how it was in the Old Testament, here's how it applies today. Right? He's, he's reasoning with them and making sense of the Old Testament scriptures. And one of the truths that we find is that it is appointed to man once to die after this, the judgment. So there's no second chance. So that proves what? That proves that Jesus did not go to hell to preach the gospel. You know, people just find that offensive because that's what they've been taught by their false preachers, okay? So, the statement that I made was this, hell is where the dead are and have always been. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter number 32. Deuteronomy chapter 32. And you're going to see this, hell has always been hell. Why, why does it talk about in Isaiah that hell hath enlarged herself, okay, if all these people, like, get 
a second chance. Wouldn't it have shrunk itself? I mean, I, I'm just guessing, but I'll bet that like a majority of people in health that got a second chance would probably leave. Yeah. <laughs> right? Where the flame dieth not, <laughs> or where the worm dieth not, and the flame is not, shall not be quenched. I mean, that does not sound like a, a place that most people would want to stay forever. Right. Now, are there some that, well, I don't know. That's a stupid question, right? It, it's torment. Right. Yeah. It's torture, okay? Look at this. The first time that the word hell is mentioned in the Bible, Deuteronomy 32, 22, look at this. It says this, For a fire is kindled in mine anger, and shall burn unto the lowest hell. Obviously, if there's a lowest hell, then there's probably a highest hell, right? There has to be some like level here, but it says this, And shall consume the earth with her increase, and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. You remember what we read in Jonah chapter 2? How Jonah described his, his uh, time in the, in the whale's belly? <laughs> right? What did he talk? He talked about the mountains. Talked about the bars of the earth. Right? That's exactly what I see when I look at this. But this is the first time the word hell is mentioned in the Bible. And you know what I don't see? I don't see a second compartment that is like paradise. Palm trees like crystal clear water that's like, unlike anything you've ever drank from before in your life. And I bring this up because I've heard it. Yeah. I've heard that preached before. Now, you don't have to turn there. Actually, you turn to Psalm chapter 9. I'm going to read for you the last time that the word hell is mentioned in the Bible. This is the 54th time, right? It says this, Revelation 2014, you know the verse well, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. The first time you see the word hell in the Bible... There's no compartments. It's one place, yep. and it's fire. It's hell. It's a bad place. The last time that you read it, it's fire. It's hell. It's the second death. It's the bad place. Yep. Yep. There's no second compartment. We don't have time, and I preached about hell not too long ago, but if you read every single time, hell, pit, um, you know, uh, outer darkness, all that stuff that refers to hell in the Bible, you read all those passages, you're never going to come away with a clear understanding of Abraham's bosom. Yep. Yep. Abraham's bosom was a body part. Yep. <laughs> it's that simple. All right, Psalm chapter 9. I just wanted to mention this. Look at verse 17. It says this, The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God, Amen. and including the United States of America. Yep. So, again... What does it say here? The wicked shall be turned into hell. If hell's so wrong, oh, it's Hades, oh, it's Sheol, oh, it's this other, oh, it's the grave. Where is that in the Bible? Right. If it's not in the Bible, then you're pretty much a Catholic. Yeah. Yeah. Or you're a Mormon. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Man's the final authority. Because I can't come to that conclusion by myself. You can't come to that conclusion by yourself. You had to be taught that by some bozo clown that got that from a Schofield reference Bible. Yep. And where did he get it from? Probably the devil himself. Yep. All right, go to uh, Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. We're going to move on here. Exodus chapter 12. Getting close to being done. Exodus chapter 12. And so I just wanted to prove that point, that hell is where the dead are and have always been. Okay, they've always been there. Hell is consistent. Fire, brimstone, torture, torment, from the first mention in the Bible to the very last. There is no change. It's consistent. There's never any mention of a compartment of good people, anything like that in the Bible. So here's the next statement that I want to make about this doctrine, and it's this. The Old Testament offerings picture Jesus going to hell. So let's just quickly take a look at it. Exodus chapter 12, verse 5. It says this, Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side uh, on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the houses wherein they shall eat it obviously picturing the cross verse 8 and they shall eat the flesh in that night roast with 
fire and unleavened bread and with bitter herbs they shall eat it now oftentimes god had them do things or he you know we read we've just read a lot of the old testament you know jonah or psalms um he, he writes things, he gives them demonstrations, he has them do these offerings, as why? As a picture of what was to come. So the, 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 um, the Jews were supposed to, to see these things, hear these teachings, and, and relate to, to what they learned in the Bible, learned what the forefathers did, learning these passages, and said, oh, they're, they're supposed to say, oh, yeah, that's, that's right. That's why he, God had us do this. It was a picture of what he was to do for us. But by the time you get to the time of Christ, by and large, you have a false religion where they're not doing the offerings right most of the time. Uh, traditions of man have basically passed the law of God. Now look at verse 9. It says, Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs, and with the pertinence thereof. Verse 10. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire. Why was it burnt with fire and not sodden? Because it's a picture of what Christ did for us. He became the offering for us. Why are there verses about him becoming the offering for us? <laughs> you know, if, if this wasn't a picture of that. Of course it was. Were they supposed to eat of this thing sodden or, or just boiled? No. Not unless you're Eli's kids. And you <laughs> right? And you just want to mess this thing up. Real quickly, go to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. So again, like I've already said, Hebrews is a book where they're trying to get the Hebrews to understand what happened and saying, hey, remember these things were written. Remember these things that we've been taught are for you to understand the true Messiah so that you can have some discernment and say, okay, he was the one. Not the one that comes in his own name, but the one that glorified himself not, but gave all praise and glory to the Father. Look at verse 10. Hebrews 13, verse 10 says this. We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat, which serve the tabernacle for the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. So why is he making reference back to the offerings we read in Exodus chapter 12? Right? And you noted, why, why is he doing that? Burned without the camp. Why is he making that connection there? Because Jesus went to hell. He became the offering for us, right? Was Jesus not burned without the camp in the heart of the earth? Right? right? I mean, that, it makes perfect sense. Verse 12, Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. And they'll say, well, that's the, the cross that, and stuff. That was without the gate, right? That's a, it's like, that's not the full story, though. Right. Yeah. All I'm trying to tell you is that, you know, when you read through the Bible, it makes perfect sense. You have, you know, if you just put away the study notes from these idiots and their stupid teachings of what they tell you it means, and you read for yourself, right. it's like, okay, it says hell, it means hell. Right. It's, it's that simple. Yeah. Hell means hell. <laughs> How's that for a sermon title? <laughs> All right, real quick, turn to, uh, I should have had you keep your place there, but go back to Isaiah. We're going to look at Isaiah 53. We're getting close, closer to being done. Isaiah 53. Look at verse number six. It says this very familiar passage. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shears is dumb. So he openeth not his mouth. Verse eight. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. You see that same language there in Hebrews, without the gate, right? Without the camp. That means outside of it. Verse 9, and he made his grave with the wicked. Now let me ask you this. Who was in the tomb right next to, to Jesus? Do you know? Where does it say that? Has anybody got a clue? Okay, read verse 9 again. And he made his grave with the wicked. That's hell. Yeah. <laughs> That's hell, okay? <laughs> You're like, who is his neighbor? Wait, what? what? <laughs> no, I'm not trying to check it. I'm just, I'm just simply saying, because I've had pastors say, well, every time you see the word hell in the Bible, at least in the Old Testament, it means grave. That's it. And then I've even heard one guy, he quoted this here, and say, see, he made his grave with the wicked. And that was the two thieves on the cross. 
because they were wicked. What about the guy that got saved? Yeah. <laughs> you going to tell me that he's wicked now too? That his sins and his iniquities weren't forgiven? Right. It's ridiculous. But he made his grave with the wicked. What did Proverbs chapter 9 say? That the wicked shall be turned into what? Hell. Into hell. That's right. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Verse 10, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. That's Psalm chapter 16. That's Acts chapter 2, right? Look at verse 11. He shall see the travail of his flesh. Is that what it says? That's not what it says, is it? It says, he shall see the travail of his soul. Where was Jesus' soul after he died? That's right. Is, is hell paradise? No, it's not. He made his grave with the wicked, right? He shall see the travail of his soul, which is also what? The pains that were loosed. We read about in Acts chapter 2. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. And again, just a quick reminder, Acts 2.24 whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Does that sound like this verse here? Isaiah 53, 11, He shall see the travail of his soul. You know why I had you read Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7? Is because when Jesus died, his soul went to hell. Where did the spirit go? It went up. It went up which is a good way to defend the doctrine when people say, well, he said to the thief on the cross today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. And so he went down to Abraham's bosom to the paradise side of hell, right? Nope. Well, no, <laughs> no, his spirit descended. His soul was in hell. Right. Remember, Jesus was fully man and fully God. Uh, Isaiah 53, real quick. Let's just read verse 12. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great and he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he hath poured out his soul on to death and he was numbered with the transgressors and he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors uh, transgressors okay go to let's see here go to luke chapter 23 luke chapter 23 so we're just going to move on here next statement is this the king james bible translators knew how to use the word hell and they knew how to use the word paradise and they knew how to use them in the right context it's that simple okay i the word paradise here, you're going to find it about three times in the Bible. Um, you don't have to turn there, but let me just read two of them for you. 2 Corinthians 12, 4. How that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for man to utter. Revelation 2, 7. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit hath saith, or Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Luke chapter 23, look at verse 43. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Okay. Well, I just wanted to show you those other two verses, you know, 2 Corinthians 12 and Revelation 2, because paradise is described as up, no mention of it ever being down or relocated. How did Elijah go up by whirlwind into heaven? But yet you say he, he went like this up and then all oh, the way down over here, right? Yeah, sure thing, pal. That's... <laughs> Yeah, go to John chapter 10, John chapter 10. So I just want to give you just a couple things to think about, just three things to, to maybe say to somebody that pulls this on you. And they'll take you to Luke 23, 43. See, he said paradise. He said he'd be with me in paradise, so he didn't go to hell. And then you have the next question actually has to be, well, what does Acts chapter 2 verse 31 mean then? And they'll say, well, that's Abraham's bosom. <laughs> Why doesn't it just say Abraham's bosom then? John chapter 10, look at verse 29. My father which gave them me is greater than all. No man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. Look at verse 30. I and my father are one. So could Jesus tell the thief on the cross today that will be with me in paradise and then go to hell for three days, three nights, his soul and not be lying? Yes. 
Yes, and that's all I'm trying to say. So that's one thing you could show somebody that may be mixed up or confused. Go back to John chapter 3, and we'll take a look at one verse here. Jesus talking to Nicodemus, and he says this in verse 13. John 3, 13. And no man hath ascended up to heaven. See, they'll say, see, no man hath ascended up to heaven. What he's talking about there is no man of his own accord hath ascended up to heaven under his own power. Right. right? But he says, and no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. So Jesus is talking to Nicodemus and telling him the son of man is in heaven, but he's on earth talking to Nicodemus. Right. Was he lying? No. no. Is he not fully God? Yes. Is he omnipresent? Yes. He's everywhere. Amen. So taking you to Luke 23, 43 and pulling the paradise card is a weak, disgusting, embarrassing argument to the real Bible student. All right. And, and here's one more thing that I'll, I'll often ask people say, okay, all right, man. I don't understand your gymnastics here, but let me, let me just try to get the, the, these thoughts together. I'll say this. Okay, look. What day and time is it in heaven right now? <laughs> Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Okay, so you're saying that that means he couldn't have gone to hell for three days, three nights. But yet he went to Abraham's bosom for three days, three nights. Okay, I'm trying to make sense of this. You know, I... I, I I write these sermons and I try to like mention what these people preach and I get all confused and mixed up. But, but okay. So let's say this. Jesus died. His soul went to hell for three days, three nights. Okay. Comes back up. He, he's resurrected. He's, he's showing himself into the disciples. And then he finally ascends to the right hand of the father. What day is it at that time in heaven? How much time's passed? It's eternity, right? right. So, it, was he lying when he said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise? No, it's the same day. Right. Yeah. It, it's eternity. Yeah. Unless anybody in here has got a, a, a clock that, <laughs> you know, we can go to that's going to highlight what time it is in eternity right now. Right? I mean, does anybody know that? Kenley, where, do you know where that's at? <laughs> you don't want to talk, huh? See, anybody? I know we only have like three people here tonight because of the lockdown, but... Somebody's got to help me out. Is there an eternal clock somewhere that I'm missing? So that's ridiculous. This is one of the reasons why I, I like to preach against this, but it's hard not to just crack up and just... Because I want to just read Acts 2.31 and close the Bible and move on to something else. Amen. But you got to preach this stuff because it's out there. Right. You know, people are really mixed up with this stuff. And, and like I always say, if you can help somebody and clear this stuff up with them, you know, amen. It's a good deal. And we need to get these things in order and make sure they're always at the forefront of our minds. So just, uh, I just want to leave you with a couple reminders here. Go to John chapter 19. John chapter 19. Remember this. So answering the critics, just remember this. Jesus' soul went to hell, not his flesh, not the spirit. Acts 2.31, he's seen this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. Right? Jesus' spirit went to heaven. John 19.30 when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished and bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Where, what is another word for the ghost in the Bible? It's spirit. Where do the spirits go? They go up. Okay. So was he lying to the thief on the cross? No. Could he still go up? His spirit go up and his soul go to hell? Yes. That's what happened. It's very clear. Again, quick reminder, Ecclesiastes 12, 7. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was and the spirit shall return to God whom gave it. That's a fact. Amen. Not making stuff up here. Okay. And you know what? If you were to read this in a Chinese Bible, it should say the same thing. Amen. Or an Aramaic Bible or a Greek Bible or a Hebrew Bible or a Japanese Bible. It should say the same thing. Amen. All right. Real quickly here. Go to Luke chapter 16. I'm try to get through all this stuff real quick here. So let's take a, uh, one, one more look. Because... Another thing people do is take you to this parable, or is, this is not a parable, actually. There's, you know, the, uh, the rich man, Lazarus, you know why this isn't a parable? Because there's names and there's specifics given here. This is a true story here. Uh, real quickly, Acts 16, look at verse 19. I just want to give you some things to think about here. 
Verse 19, there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. Verse 22, and it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Why doesn't it say carried down to Abraham's bosom? No, it says carried into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried and in hell he lift up his eyes being in torments and seeth Abraham or seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. So people will say, see, this is where Jesus went. He went to Abraham's bosom. This proves two compartments. Um, I'm not going to have you turn there for the sake of time, but I just want you to, to look at the beginning of verse 23 there. And in hell, he lift up his eyes. What they want you to believe is that he's in hell and he's got his eyes closed and he lifts them up. Like he opens them. Like it's another expression for saying open. I don't believe that. I don't believe that at all. I believe when he lift up his eyes, he actually lifted his eyeballs up, not his eyelids up. Okay, eyeballs. It says eyes. It doesn't say eyelids. Just listen to this language here. Genesis 13, verse 14. And the Lord said to Abram, after that lot was separated from him, lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art northward, southward, and eastward, and westward. Is God telling Abraham to open up his eyes? No, he's telling him to look in the direction he wants him to look, right? You see that? If you just study this phrase in the Bible, lift up your eyes, it doesn't talk about people opening their eyes. That's a different way. Okay, That's, that's totally different. Genesis 31, 12 says this. I just wrote these down here not too long. Genesis 31, 12. And he said, lift up now thine eyes and see all the rams which leap upon the cattle are ring straked, speckled and grizzled. For I have seen all that Laban doeth unto thee, unto thee. So is God telling Jacob to open his eyes? No, lift up and look, right? That's what he's saying. Here's a, here's one that'll, that'll smoke everybody here. Uh, let's see if I can find it. Deuteronomy chapter number four, verse 19. It says this, and lest thou lift up thine eyes unto heaven. Now that's strange. And lest thou lift up thine eyes unto heaven. Now is he talking about opening your eyes? Which direction do the eyeballs need to face to look at heaven? Up. And when thou seest the sun and the moon and the stars, even all the host of heaven, shouldest be driven to worship them and serve them, which the Lord the God hath divided unto all the nations under the whole heaven. And who's above all that stuff? heaven god's throne right it, it, you know we're gonna have to i had a few more but we just don't have time for that uh you're still there in luke chapter 23 or i'm sorry luke 16 look at verse 23 and in hell he lift up his eyes being in torment so he's in pain and he lifts up his eyes and god lets him see lazarus in abraham's bosom now why doesn't it say here being in torment in abraham's bosom sees lazarus and abraham together <laughs> Because if Abraham's bosom's a place of two compartments, wouldn't it say that right here? Yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. Who's in Abraham's bosom in verse 23? Lazarus or the rich man? Lazarus. If you were to write the rich man, you'd be wrong. You'd get that wrong on a test. Right? Even a heathen would have to admit that. Right? You'd get that wrong. Verse 24, and he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. This guy is still <laughs> just doesn't get it. Verse 25, and Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. And then I'll just want you to focus on, on that and be like, well, the great Gulf fix was just like a wall, man. And over here was Abraham's bosom. Over here is, I don't know, Hades, Sheol. I, it depends on who you talk to. But it's not hell because hell's the grave, right? I mean, that apparently that's what these guys say. Verse 27, then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them. Lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, they have Moses and the prophets, let him hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went to them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto them, If they will not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. So real quickly here, just listen to this. The rich man is in hell. There's no debating that. There's no way out of that. The rich man is in hell, not Abraham's bosom. Right. Verse 23 is clear. Who's in Abraham's bosom? It's Lazarus. 
You know, and you can read about Abraham's bosom back in Genesis. It's bosom. It's body part. Okay, it's chest. So again, Lazarus is in Abraham's physical bosom. This means when a person dies, apparently they get to go meet Abraham. Okay? And God's allowing this rich man to see what he missed out on. That's part of the torments. Okay? Wicked people in the Old Testament went to hell. Right. This is a New Testament book. We classify this as a New Testament book, Luke chapter, well, the whole book of Luke, obviously. But chapter 16 is actually taking place in the Old Testament. So think about that. And you know why? Because of this verse right here. Hebrews 9, 16, you don't have to turn there. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death, I'm sorry, the death of the testator. So has Jesus died yet in Luke 16? Nope. So we're still in Old Testament times, right? And we see the rich man went to hell. He didn't go to Abraham's bosom. Right. He went to hell. It's consistent with everything else in the Bible you'll read regarding hell. Verse 17 says this in Hebrews 9. It says, For a testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth, whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. So obviously the New Testament began when? After Jesus died. So Luke 16 is an Old Testament verse. Hell is still down like the rest of the Bible teaches. And the dude's looking up. And guess what? Heaven's up. It was up in the Old Testament. That's why Elijah went up. But you try to tell some of these people that and they just want to just tap dance and play that twister game. I feel like they have that little spinny thing. And they just pull it out of their pocket. They got a mini one and just pin it. Okay. First Peter 4, okay, uh, I will try twisting Psalm 6, okay, uh, let me try, try this, oh, Elijah went up and then down because of the curvature of the earth, okay, yeah, you know what I mean, that, that's how they got to be playing this game, yeah. or the purpose of lying, this is ridiculous, here, so, I had something else I want to say, but I might have forgot it, but, um, you get the point, right? This is still Old Testament here that's going on in Luke chapter 16, verse 31. And it, it just makes perfect sense that Jesus... Oh, yeah. So the guy's asking... That's right. The, the rich man's asking Abraham to send Lazarus. And then he's asking Abraham, well, send somebody dead to go talk to my relatives. Why didn't he just... Why didn't Abraham say, don't worry, you're going to get a second chance. Right. right? Right? Don't worry, dude. Just when Jesus dies on the cross, he's going to come back down there and preach to the spirits in prison. And then you get your second chance. Right. Then you can get out, and then you can go tell your family. It'll be a wonderful, glorious, joyous thing. If that was true, that, that prison in 1 Peter 3 meant that Jesus went to hell to preach the gospel, why didn't Abraham, this would have been the perfect time to say that. But it doesn't say it because it's not true. So we we got to be done. Like I, I'm just going to go way too long. I knew that was going to happen because there's so much into this that, I mean, I could just go forever, but, you know, I'll be on... But tomorrow by midnight, I'll probably be on the rapture and you guys will still be sleeping. So we've got to be done. I just wanted to give you some things to think about and just preach against that doctrine. You know, from time to time, that stuff just needs to be hammered down. And I'm just going to cut it off right here. and We're going to pray. Thank you so much, Lord, uh, for those that, uh, that came tonight and are able to help. And those that are stuck at home, Lord, I just pray you'd uh, keep us all strong and bring us back together as a full congregation as soon as possible. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen.